So let's move on to, to segment two here. And this is where we're going to go over the Big Ten. And we're going to start with the Big Ten East first. And, and again, we'll kind of do this at a, a higher level than what we'll do with the Big Ten West. But uh, I'm, we're looking at the graphic here. You have Ohio State first, Michigan second, Penn State third, Michigan State fourth, uh, Maryland fifth, Indiana sixth, and Rutgers in seventh. So, uh, Brett, kind of go through that, I guess, start from top to bottom. And, and what are you seeing going on in the East this year? Yeah, so, I, you know, this is a great top four. When we talk uh, deep divisions, this top four is, is really strong. It always is. It's the same top four as usual. It's Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State. And in that order, I've got it. Um, Ohio State, I touched on at the top. Um, incredible offense, improving defense. Michigan at number two. I think they have some staying power here. They're not going to fall off uh, after their surprise playoff run last year. It was the number one most improved defense year over year last year. I think the wrong uh, Michigan coordinator won the Broyles Award, honestly. It was given to Josh Gaddis on offense. Should have been McDonald on defense. But, um, yeah, but they bring back uh, their, whole, their whole offensive lines back, and they were top ten in both my run push and my pass pro. Uh, so a lot to like from Michigan at number two. And then it became a battle for third for me uh, between Penn State and Michigan State, and I've seen this flip-flop both ways. I went with Penn State. Um, they have a, a, you know, a really – strong recruiting profile. Um, they just signed the number six class in the country, actually, and it really targeted some key spots they were missing on. Uh, their run game really struggled last year. They go out and sign the number one running back in the country. Um, Sean Clifford is back. We, we know what we have with him um, at Penn State, but they were really close in a lot of games. They're the Nebraska of the East in terms of one-score losses. You go look at their, go look at their output last year. It's incredible. Uh, so they're better than they showed. Uh, Michigan State, great transfer experiment two cycles ago. It paid off big time. They were the surprise team last year, but I see them coming back down to earth. Uh, a lot of fluky wins when you dig into it, and Nebraska fans are, are familiar with one of those uh, if you had punted <laughs> to the right side of the field. Um, but then, uh, yeah, and then from there, there's a huge gap, and uh, the three down there, Maryland, Indiana, Rutgers. Uh, Maryland, a great offense. The other two are, are rebuilding. Yeah, I mean, from as a Husker fan, the thing that sticks out to me here is when I think of the schedule that we had last year, I see our crossovers were three of the top four teams, Michigan, Michigan State, and Ohio State a year ago. And this year it's Michigan and then it's Indiana and Rutgers. So for Husker fans, especially, I mean, if you're the really hardened realist that, you know, doesn't, how you can't see how Vegas has us at seven and a half uh, wins. You know, how can we be that much better? I don't know that we have to be that much better just solely off of the schedule changes alone can, can certainly add a couple of wins, assuming that Nebraska doesn't, kick the ball the wrong side of the field and do some of the things that they did last year. Yeah. And uh, Nebraska has been unfortunate in being locked into a cross division rivalry a protected game with Ohio state for the past decade. I mean, uh, of course that's two great programs facing off, but in terms of win loss, I mean, that's just totally unfair when you have some guys locked in with Rutgers. So finally mm -hmm. Nebraska gets a schedule boost. Uh, yeah. Michigan will be very tough, but from there you get two of the bottom three and uh, that, that'll pay dividends. That was one of the key factors actually in deciding a very tight middle of the pack in the West. We'll get to that next, but uh, schedule goes a long way. I see four teams over there that are pretty much even, it looks like. Uh, there's pros and cons to each, but the schedule boost finally goes Nebraska's way. Mm -hmm. Rob, what do, you, uh, do you have any questions or any thoughts on the, the Big Ten East? Does anybody else, uh, any of the comments that have come in? No, I mean, on that? I, I, with Michigan and Ohio State at the top there, that's obvious. I, it was an interesting comment that you made about Penn state being the Nebraska of, of the East, because um, I think what they have, they had eight one score losses. I think that was the number of it that, that I think that's what I read on there or something, or were they six and six or so? I, I'm trying yeah, to, it was, uh, it. I think they had five, one score losses, five, one score. Um, that's what it was. Sorry. But really? I mean, that, that goes, well, yeah, Nebraska with eight is an all time record. That's we won't yeah, be matching that hopefully was, anytime yeah. soon, but um yeah, Penn State with five close games, and, and and really sum it up with this. Their season, they were number two in the country heading into Iowa, and they were mm -hmm. leading 17-0 and you know, seemingly going to win the game. And uh, the quarterback gets knocked out. Jack Campbell yep. lights up Sean Clifford. They collapse from there in-game. They lose, and then they lose out from there. So, um, you know, not to say that that changed their whole season, but uh, they were better than that record showed. And they're kind of the inverse of Michigan State. Michigan State had a lot of fluky close wins. And uh, actually, I think Penn State was graded higher in game grader despite a seven and six compared to an 11 win Michigan state. So it's not mm -hmm. the only thing I look at, but it certainly is something to look at. It's, it's funny because I don't hear a lot of people say that about Michigan state either though, is that um, with, with Michigan state, there's a lot of people that are still pretty high on them and saying, Oh, they're the team to keep an eye on in that division. And, you know, you don't sound very high on them at all. And, you know, I understand your reasoning behind it. So. 
Yeah, when you look at uh, Michigan State, they were down all the way at 25th in my game grader, uh, despite an 11 win and uh, and Power Five. Or I'm sorry, New Year's Six bowl win. Uh, they they lose Kenneth Walker, the the Doak Walker Award. He single handedly changed that offense. The year before that, they had to have a single running back with a rushing touchdown. Think of how statistically improbable that is. Mm-hmm. And then he comes in and scores five in the opener and goes crazy all season. So without Walker, uh, their pass defense was also one of the worst in the country. And most of that talent is gone that they did have. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm selling Michigan State slightly. I still have them ranked 23rd, but in the battle for third place, I side with Penn State. Mm-hmm. I did notice when we were talking about the player development that Michigan State was 60th. You know, and so is that over a course of a number of years, or is that are we talking about a one-year thing there with the player development when Michigan State's listed 60th? Yeah, so I got to look up the exact years, but they're mostly five-year windows. Okay. So what that's capturing specifically for Michigan State is, well, let me go a cycle before that. It used to be that D'Antonio was taking two stars and turning them into All-Americans. Uh, that was mm-hmm. the peak. So they back if I had done this metric back in 2013, they'd probably be number one. Um, but then what happened was they elevated their recruiting rankings. They were getting all these blue chippers, mm-hmm. and it just didn't work. It was actually the inverse where great recruiting, lack of output. So that's probably you're still seeing some effects of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wonder, some of these metrics I do use, it's going to be hard to keep them going because of the transfer portal. Like Michigan State, as I'm talking out loud, uh, so much of their roster wasn't recruited, per se, by, Nebraska, uh, by Michigan State out of high school. So I don't know how that's going to throw off the metrics, but yeah. I'll, I'll look into that as we evolve in this transfer portal era. You know, Brett, we talked with Coach Osborne back in, in May, and we talked about the current state of college football, about NIL and transfer portals and things like that. And he specifically highlighted one of the challenges of coaching today would be with the portal and how you basically have unrestricted free agency, how teams can just – you can just lose a bunch of guys and gain a bunch of guys. And he highlighted Michigan State as one of those examples is, you know, look at what that – transfer portal did to Michigan State a year ago and how how they could have such a, a year-to-year positive turnaround because of it. Um, other teams, if you don't hit on the right guys or if you lose the wrong guys, uh, obviously you can take a nosedive pretty quick too. Nebraska fans right now, and maybe this is uh, we, we can start to adjust to the West, but um, Nebraska fans, we, we hope that we had the offseason like Michigan State had a year ago, that the, the transfer portal is going to be nice to us and, and we made the right moves and we're going to see the immediate results of that on the field yeah well there's a lot of excitement with that transfer class and uh i think it ranks seventh nationally and um you know that's important too because it used to be in the big 10 west that nebraska distanced itself uh way ahead in the the recruiting rankings and the five-year average it was nebraska was an ace recruiter and no one else was even in the top 40 but that whole ball game is shifting where you see all-time highs from wisconsin from iowa pj fleck has signed a bunch of great classes in a row Jeff Brom stacking top 25s at Purdue is unheard of. So I think you're seeing the rest of the division catch up in the recruiting game out of high school. So it's crucial then for Nebraska to, to, to stay ahead and, uh, and sign a top 10 class. And it really targeted some key spots. I mean, I don't know if you want to go into the Nebraska preview now, but uh, high level, it targeted a quarterback, which definitely needed a transition after uh, Adrian Martinez departed. 